Okay, so my name is Kaylin Stadnick, and I am one of the standbys with the Toronto Company of Comfortable Way. And uh, what's your background? Meaning ethnic background? No, like theater. How did it all start? Oh, okay, okay. So my theater background. Well, I actually performing wise started uh, performing first as a Ukrainian dancer. <laughs> um, my family is Ukrainian, and so that was something that all of us kids did from a very young age. And I started at about the age of three, and then I started singing at the age of six. And uh, always loved performing, was always performing for the neighborhood and the family and family friends and all of that kind of stuff and in school musicals and things. But I always wanted to be a rock star. <laughs> that was my big dream was to be the next um, Anna Nancy Wilson from the rock band Heart. But then when I was nine years old, my mom took me to see a musical at Expo 86 in Vancouver, BC, and the musical was called Ain't Misbehavin'. And I absolutely fell in love with musicals, and that was where my love and adoration and addiction to musicals started, so probably around the age of nine. And I started really diving into professional singing lessons and dancing lessons and acting lessons. And then I went to theater school at um, Grant McEwen College in Edmonton and started working right out of theater school and just have been working ever since. So it's been, well, over 20 years now that I've been a professional in the industry. <laughs> Can you please tell me about the auditions for I Come From Away? Oh, gosh. Okay, so... Well... Like, what do you remember? Well, what... I so, my um, first memory ever of anything to do with Come From Away was uh, people, a couple of different people reached out to me when Come From Away was being workshopped here in Toronto at Sheridan and there were a few people that came to me and said, Kaylin, you need to get a hold of this show. You, as soon as you can see it or as soon as you can hear it or something, you need to because there's a part in that show that was like written for you. <laughs> And so um, I did, as soon as I heard it, I was like, oh, yeah, they're right. There's a part in it that is exactly kind of what I do. And Which uh, part was that? Uh, Beverly. Yeah, and uh, so I was very excited about it and followed. I never got a chance to see it because I lived in Vancouver. So Vancouver was my home for 17 years. And uh, it's not where I'm from, but that was where I was living at the time. And I never got out here to see it, but I was following it. And I knew the soundtrack, like, you know, completely. And I knew the story and I knew everything about it. And I actually happened to be in Ontario when they did, when they started doing the auditions for the Toronto Company. And because I was in Hamilton doing a show at Theatre Aquarius. And so they brought me out for the role uh, of Beverly. And from there, it just went, um, they brought me back a couple of times, actually. I went to a couple of the callbacks. And they kept seeing me for that role. I sang that song a bunch of times. And then they also were giving me, they give me, you know, pages of some of the other characters and send me away to go work on that and then bring me back. So I came in like three or four times for the show. And uh, the day before, so my second last audition, I remember getting a call. I was out with friends because I was only here for the weekend, um, knowing that I was just in town for the callbacks. And I did get a call from the agency asking if, saying that the creative team was wondering if I would consider being a standby and I said yes of course but does that mean I'm not does that mean I'm no longer in the running for the part and they said no that's not it they're still considering you but they just wanted to know if that's even going to be a possibility so I said okay yes I want to be involved in the show so you know put my interest out there and then the next day I got a call that they were still considering me for that part and they're still looking at me as a standby. So they asked me to come back with all new characters, some of the characters that I hadn't read for before. So I learned all of that stuff and then came back the next morning and did another, uh, one more, like last audition, I think I was the last person they saw in Toronto before they left again for New York. And about a half an hour after I got home, I got the call that they were offering me uh, the role of one of the standbys. So I said yes and 
I sold everything I owned in Vancouver and I move up, moved up to Toronto to join the company and now I've been here for, you know, it's going on two years. Oh, that's yeah. quite a journey. <laughs> yeah. From all the way from West Coast. Yeah, here. yeah. It's been a big, big change, but it's been great. Yeah. How did you learn, you know, all these tracks? Oh, it, you know, it was, I have to say it's been the most challenging thing I've ever done in my career. And I've had a really great career. I've played a lot of really big roles, really challenging roles. It's, I've been blessed. Um, and I've done roles that have been very scary and very hard to learn, but nothing compares to being a standby and come from away. It is the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, I always tell people, no word of a lie, for about the first month of rehearsals, I pretty much cried every moment I was alone <laughs> because it was so stressful. But now, you know, all of this time later and, and having all four ro roles under my belt and, you know, we all are, you know, all of us standbys go on often. So it feels like that was a world away, that that fear and that stress that it took to learn the roles seems like it was so long ago, but it really was difficult. And because I'd never been a standby before, um, I didn't really know what the process would be like. Um, so it was actually the process for me changed. It, it, sometimes on a daily basis when we were in rehearsals because I wasn't exactly sure the best approach to it and then I did find a process that worked for me and it was I had two different scripts um, going and each script was two different characters so I'd have one script that was just dedicated to Beverly and Diane's tract and then uh, one script that was just ded dedicated to um, Beulah and Janice and I would divide <laughs> like divide the pages and have arrows and numbers. I have, you know, this crazy number system and um, because everything is numbers in the show, that's how we know where our spots are. It's all color coded and numbered. So I would have those scripts um, and that's how I learned it originally and then transferred all of those to cue cards that are literally just, it, it's almost like hieroglyphics. Like no one out, maybe some of the understudies would understand if they looked at mine because I think we each have a different process. But um, it basically, my cue cards are, you know, like titles of the, the parts of the show or the songs of the show and then it's just numbers and arrows and colors and I know what that means. So if I need to glance at them or say if I haven't been on for a role in a really long time, I will you know, just that night before going on, I would glance at them or I have two sets of them. I have one set at the theater and one set at home. So if I'm, you know, riding the subway in that night, I might have my cue cards with me and reading them on the, on the train just to make sure to refresh. I'm like, oh yeah, that's, that's when I do that. Or, you know, there's different movement sequences that all, obviously, you know, that all the characters do. And so I have those little kind of cheat words and I, I know what that means if I have, you know, up first written down or first group, second group, I know what that means for that character. So the whole thing with learning all four parts was a, 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 just a learning process in itself, not just the learning of the four parts, but the learning how to learn the four parts was also an interesting part of the process. And um, for me, I actually sing all four harmonies in the show because each one of my characters is on a different harmony line and that has been very demanding <laughs> and my score is completely color coded. So each role has a different color and if you look at that score it's all it just looks like a rainbow of colors but you know, that's that's how I learned the the um, system there and that's a really difficult part of being a standby is the harmony lines. I mean it's all difficult but having to learn all four harmonies was a little bit mind blowing for me. <laughs> so, um, but it's it's going well. I mean, we all do you know great jobs when we go on, and um, it's been really fun. I've really enjoyed the challenge of it. So, yeah, I hope that answers it. <laughs> Did you learn uh, tracks one by one or simultaneously all of them? Well, we kind of because we were here from the beginning of the process. Um, I, we, we learned them kind of all together, 
but we were told to concentrate kind of on our primaries. We were each given two primary covers and two secondary covers. So we had to basically kind of learn them all at once, but we're told to concentrate on your primaries first, you know, a little bit more because what happens is we do, during our rehearsal process, we do put-ins, what's called a put-in rehearsal. So that's where we standbys get to, so the six of us get to do the show full out with the other six members of the performing company and we get to do that for every character, not in front of the audience, but full costume, full lights, full band, as if you were doing the show for real. And so we had, you know, say a month of, uh, or whatever it was, five or six weeks of the regular rehearsals for the performing cast where we were in the room the whole time learning everything, soaking up as much as we could. And then once the show started its previews in Winnipeg, then we started our rehearsals where we actually got to be up on our feet working it. And we did something like every, I can't remember what it was, every three weeks or something, what uh, we would do a put in. So we'd concentrate, you know, every single day, rehearse every single day until we all knew our track one. And then we'd do a put in and then we'd go into track two. So we, so we did kind of learn all four of them, but concentrated on one at a time for each put in. But there were times that some of us went on, like went on in front of audiences before we ever got to do our put in. So that was really interesting. I think Kate got to do that and I think Jeff possibly got to do that. Oh, Amir. So there's, you know, some really, you know, scary moments. Um, of that but it's but it's thrilling and our cast you know really takes care of everyone on stage you have to you have to work as a unit in this show and it all went off really well for everybody yeah what do you remember about your first performance as a stand with you gosh what do i remember like what track was it that my very first track was beulah which was my third track wow. so funny enough um one of my secondary tracks, but they put me on as Beulah, and I don't know if I remember anything. I think it's such a blur. I think for each character that you go on for, it's so scary and so thrilling that the whole event kind of just seems like a blur. Uh, blur. I don't know, blur. <laughs> uh, I don't know that I remember a lot about the Beulah track when I went on for Beulah the first time. The ones that stick out to me are the, when I went on for Beverly and when I went on for Janice. Um, Beverly, because I do feel so attached to the role in terms of, it just feels so right uh, for me. So that was an, an extra thrilling night for me. It just felt like I was at home and it felt really uh, good and and secure and confident so I loved that night and I remember crying like I remember coming off stage and and Dana our resident director throwing her arms around me and I was crying because it was just this beautiful experience of you know all of these years of kind of waiting to be able to get out there and do that role was a real blessing and that felt great. And then I definitely remember the Janice time because I've only been on for it once. It's kind of that track that everybody joked about, oh, it's never gonna happen because it's you know my last one. I'm the second um, cover for it. I'm not really supposed to go on for it, you know, unless there's like a major emergency. And of course that's what happened. And I got thrown on and hadn't done it like we hadn't done it in so long. It had been like six months or something since my put in. And we do have our rehearsals that we do every week or every two weeks as standbys, but it but it still had been, you know, our rehearsals are just the standbys. They're not all 12 characters on stage. So it's quite different from when you actually get to go on. So getting thrown into doing the Janice track was a complete whirlwind and I was shaking the whole time and <laughs> really nervous, but it went off really well. It felt, um, I felt almost hysterical because it was so much fun to be that nervous and to be that, like everybody was joking around, joking around about, you know, saying like, this was never supposed to happen. So it was really fun. But um, the one thing that I always say to everybody is, 
that after the first time I was ever on for any of the tracks, the next day when you wake up in the morning, it feels like you've been hit by a Mack truck because your adrenaline is so high the night before, like during the show, that when you crash, like you sleep so hard and then you wake up the next day going, oh, like it feels like you ran a marathon the night before. So that's maybe one of the more interesting, difficult parts of being a standby is that you don't get to get it in your bones like the performing cast who they're just used to it, they get to do it eight times a week so they get rid of that adrenaline rush. Whereas for us, almost every time we go on, there's still quite a bit of an adrenaline rush because we don't get to do it eight times a week like you normally do in a, a normal situation when you're just playing the role. So it's always uh, what that does to your body is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and how frequently do you do it? Well, it's different for all of us. Um, um, you know, so it, honestly, there isn't really like a straight answer for that because it's kind of all over the place. Sometimes you'll be on multiple times a week for a week straight sometimes you won't do anything you know i had a, a portion of time last fall where i didn't do anything for about two months so where it was just you know coming to work because we did we are at every single show so we're here eight times a week just like the rest of the company and um so that the the waiting can be difficult but when you do get to go on it's really fun but there is there's no like there's no guarantees there's no you know guaranteed amount of shows you're going to do you don't know when you don't you know you could get the call i've gone on in as little as 15 minutes notice um, but I also have had months notice of when I'm going on because if people book vacation time then you know months out that that's when you're you know I'm going on for a full week when that person's away on vacation or whatever but other times you just get the call during the day that someone's sick or there's an injury or you know a, a family emergency or something that takes place and so then you're on and you sometimes could do like one show you know like one off in a week and other times you know, maybe somebody has the flu or something and so you're on for three times in a week, but there's no, it, it's all different. Every, all six of us, it's all a different amount and um, there's no, you just don't know. It's a mystery every week of if you're going to get on or not. Oh, 15 minutes. How do you manage to prepare, like warm up your voice? I don't know. <laughs> it was, it was pretty shocking that one that happened that one time and it was just a, major rush to get into you know everybody's rushing around costume the costume department the wig department sound department everybody had to rush around and get it all you know together and i very quickly threw on some makeup and threw on a wig cap and got in and kind of did a few little warm-up things uh luckily that um the show kind of it builds vocally you know so where the show kind of starts and how we sing um, one of the terms that our music director uses all the time is hushed intensity. So it kind of starts at that place and then it built, you know, it really builds vocally. So it's kind of almost like a little bit of a, a vocal warm up in itself. So I did what I could to vocally warm up as I was throwing stuff on and continued, you know, doing a couple of little uh, vocalese things as I got into place and then used the show to warm up <laughs> and, 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 until the big Me and the Sky song came, so, yeah. Is there anything you would like to talk about? We have 12 minutes left. Hmm. I don't know. I'm not exactly sure if there's anything that we're not necessarily covering. Um, I, I think, I mean, being a standby is a very different world. Um, as I said, my career has been very sp specific in itself. I've been in the business, like I said, for over 20 years, and I've only ever played lead roles uh, before. So coming into a, a standby situation, I feel has been not only challenging technically and with the, you know, with 
the, the skills that you need to be a standby, which I don't even think any of us knew we had. <laughs> it's not it's not something you know you can do until you're just thrown in and can do it. So that's been very interesting, but I also think, and I, I talk about this with close friends and family a lot, is that being a standby is, um, it's a, it's a, I say it's a lesson in patience and humility, and which is, they're very good lessons, especially in our industry, um, because you can't, nothing is ever about you <laughs> as a standby. And, I, and if you come from a place where you're very used to, you know, being the star of the show or being, you know, being um, kind of maybe someone who, who is in a, in a different place in terms of, um, like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, like, let's say just with reviews or with press or things, which are, is all of, you know, a, a very important part of our industry. When you're a standby, you're not necessarily part of that. And I think that that, other than the, the technical challenges of being a standby, that's actually been possibly the one of the most challenging parts is learning how just as a human to to go what does that mean and does it mean anything and you know what how, how do I as a person want to deal with that do I want to take that to heart and make it mean something or do, or can I learn from this and step back and go actually this is just all you know like it, it all brings it down really essentially to what's important which is the work and the show instead of getting to a place of like ego driven you, you know things which I think has been really interesting it's been a roller coaster of emotions to be honest being a standby and um, I don't know that I would change that I think I'm learning a lot about myself through it and um, yeah even though that's been a difficult part of it I think it's really valuable. I think it's maybe something that maybe every actor should experience at some, at some point in their life so that they understand, you know, that every single person who's part of a company is so important and there's nothing that is more important, like no one that is more important than the other. We're all just part of this really important, um, you know, uh, uh, group that makes the whole thing function the way that it is and I I think that that's been a very valuable lesson for me as an actor and as a human. <laughs> How does some even solve puzzles during the show? Oh yeah so Katie our ASM is usually the one who comes up with the puzzles on stage like mind teasers on stage right and sh they're covered for the top of the show and then they get uncovered once the show starts so anybody who's back on stage right can read and try to figure them out and then um, they there's some people who are really like diligent about you know fi figuring them out and when they go to Katie to figure out if they've got it right and other people have things where they say it to each other at different points like if they figured it out they say it to each other backstage oh a lot of us just go and look at it and try to figure it out and then we can do you even have with time show. i mean this show is there non -stop. isn't a lot there isn't a lot and it depends on the character you're playing sometimes like some characters you have time other characters you don't have time for anything you never you know you never get off stage i i get to not have time necessarily off stage as diane but i get breathing room as Diane I can there's more times where she can sit and watch the show and you know take breathers um, but uh, it's okay <laughs> um, but nothing with uh, yeah the other the other roles are a little bit harder yeah what's uh, in your opinion the most common misconception about being a standby okay I would say the most common misconception of being a standby is that the standbys aren't as good as the performing company, that they're not as talented or that they don't play the roles as well as the performing company. Um, and that's what I would say is a misconception. I think in, in not, you know, not just talking about our show, but talking about the industry in general, there are so many thousands and thousands of people in this industry that are so talented. You could take any show and cast it 
you know, 10, 20, 30 times over with different groups of people from all over, you know, the country, and you would still always get this unbelievable show. So just because there is, you know, there's so much goes into casting. There's so many different reasons why people are cast um, in roles that they're cast in. And it doesn't, and I can say this, being someone who has played a lot of leads in her life, it doesn't mean you're the only person for the part. It just means that 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 the creative team saw that this mix, like that your what you bring along with what this person may bring, like that is going to make a really interesting connection on stage or you know what I mean? It's it's not necessarily about that one person. Like it's about so many different things. It's about look, it's about sound, it's about, you know, so there's so many different factors that go into it. And even knowing that that's there, there are still so many people that would be able to fit those factors. And so at the end of the day, it kind of just comes down to like taking a risk, like all creative teams. And I've also been on the other side of the table and directed, so I know this. You're always taking a risk. You always go, okay, I think that this is, this person has something interesting. That's what I want to see. I want to see where that goes with that role. So I'm going to cast that person, but you're still always taking that risk. And, and so I think, unfortunately, people who maybe are not in the industry, even people in the industry sometimes believe this too, but a lot of people who are not in the industry may come to a show and see like a, a you know, the playbill or the insert in the playbill that says that an understudy is on and they'll go, oh, but then they'll, they're so pleasantly surprised because of course that person is going to be amazing or else they wouldn't be here. You know what I mean? In a, in a show, especially of ca uh, the caliber of Come From Away and working for Mervish and Junkyard Dog Productions, you're getting really high caliber performers no matter what position they're in. So I think it's always a very pleasant surprise <laughs> for audience members to see the standbys go on and they go, oh my gosh, like that person was amazing and that person's a standby. You know, so I think that 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 is definitely a misconception within the industry and for normal people who might not understand it as much that that the understudies might not be as good, but I um, I say, give them a chance because you're, you're probably going to be very pleasantly surprised by any understudy that you see. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank this you. This is Zena's interview. Great. <laughs>